Chechianu. We are the last daf, page 49 of Tractate Chvuot. This is very um, exciting moment. It's a uh, nadir, it's rare in the Shas to have the whole parak, the whole chapter, chapter 8, in one daf. Rashi tells us that that's not the right location. It's actually in a uh, tractate Bava Metzia, Perika Socheret Apoalim. Here the Tana only repeat in order to put together the whole concept which we study, Shvuata Pikadon, the oath of the Pazet, when someone Nishbala Sheker Beshvuat Bekfirat Mamon, if someone, um, um, as we said, at the, since this chapter returned, to the law of, uh, of deposit, which was the subject of chapter 5. Um, we learn uh, there in the uh, second Mishnah that if a Shomer, Shomer meaning guardian, a person caring for someone else's um, object, and he swears uh, falsely about an item that uh, giving to him in regard um, um, uh, with a great trust that he is going to be a Shomer and guarded, and then he admits that he wasn't truthful, he lied about it, and then obviously he needs to return the item, and he needs to add an extra payment, the Hamishit, the fifth, and bring a special offering that is called a Sham offering. It's from the book of Vaikra, Leviticus, chapter f uh, 5, verses 14 to 16. So, um, uh, this is uh, true only um, if um, uh, uh, the uh, um, situation like that, that someone was in a total trust and it turns that uh, um, he, um, for all kind of reason, did not say the way it is, but um, um, it can be also for item that uh, that he already returned, but also if he claimed that it was lost in a way for which he is not respons responsible, because a Shomer, a guardian, who claims that the item was lost in such a way, it must he must swear a a biblical oath uh, that uh, this is indeed what happened. So. Here we see a beautiful chapter, as we said, is the last daf and is the last chapter, chapter 8, um, Arba'a Shomrim, the four um, uh, guardians. Um, it, uh, basically, the chapter explains in which cases a Shomer, a guardian, who swears that he's not responsible to pay for the loss of the deposit, is obligated to bring uh, an Asham special um, guilt offering and pay an extra uh, hamishit, a fifth, um, and in which cases he is not obligated. So, a little introduction, we learn in, in the chapter 5, um, the um, middle of the, pe uh, the chapter, Mishnah Yot uh, 4 and Mishnah 5, that a person is not obligated to bring an um, offering for a false oath of deposit, uh, unless his oath serve, save him from paying a claim. And we learn that if the uh, person swore falsely about the actually happened, uh, but it did not um, uh, free him from any obligation because uh, he would not have t uh, had to pay even if he had told the truth. Um, take, for example, uh, he did not obligate to bring an asham or pay an extra fifth for lying about the details. So you see here, in those cases of Shomer, of Guardian, it is necessary to know what type of losses he is responsible for uh, before we can determine whether he must bring an offering for his false oath. So uh, here let's start the chapter. We have here a different list uh, of different type of Shomrim, of guardian, and the level of responsibility that each and every one of them has. Arba'a um, Shomrim Hem. 
That's in the book of Shmot, chapter 22, the Gemara Baba Metziah 94. There are four categories of Shomrin. Um, Shomer Chinam. Shomer Chinam is unpaid Shomer guardian. Vehashoel, the borrower. Nosesachar, a Shomer who is paid. And the Hasocher and renter. The Tosfot explain you go from two extreme and in the middle. So all Shomri must pay the owner if the item in their care suffered a loss or a damage as a result of their negligence. Uh, the Torah mentions two other instances of loss or damage where some Shomri pay and some do not. One, a loss that was not caused by negligence, but which the Shomer could have prevented um, had he taken extra care. And two, a loss from something completely unavoidable, something the Shomer could not have prevented. So here the Mishnah states in which kind of losses each type of Shomer must pay and begins with an the unpaid Shomer. Shomer Chinam Nishba'al Akol. The unpaid guardian Shomer, he swears about all the cases mentioned um, earlier and uh, free himself from having to pay, which is any type of uh, guardian, any Shomer that um, they claim uh, that the item was lost or damaged, in a way for which he is not um, responsible, must wear the Torah special oath that the item was no longer in his possession and that um, what he claims is true. If he cannot prove his claim, that's uh, the Rambam, Hilchot Shelao Vepikadon, chapter 4, and um, if he does not swear, he must pay. If you remember, we studied in Baba Metzia, chapter 3. Since an unpaid Shomer does not pay for any kind of loss unless he was uh, negligent in uh, guarding the deposit, he uh, swears in all cases he was not negligent in watching it and he is uh, then free from paying for the loss. He must also swear that the item is not in his possession and he did not use it without permission. As we said, that's the Rambam Ilchot She'ela Picadon, chapter 6. So, as we said, he is basically responsible, Shomer Chinam, uh, uh, only if he was negligent. Uh, now we talk about the other extreme, the law of Bauer, Vehashuel, the Bauer, Meshalem et Hakol, pays for all type of laws even those that resulted from unavoidable event because the you borrow something the borrower benefits from having the item he may use it and he does not pay for the benefit so his responsibility is greater than that all of the other shomrim that's gemara bav metzia tzadik dalit 94b he is therefore pay for all losses except for damage that results from using the object for the purpose of which he borrowed it, which called Meta Mechamat Melacha. That's the Gemara then, Bab Metzia 96, 97, because the owner of the item clearly allowed him to use it in that way. Now we go to Nosesachar Ve'asocher, the law of paid Shomer and the renter. Nosesachar, the Shomer that, who is paid, the Hasocher and the renter. So that's uh, referring to a renter. Uh, the Torah makes it clear only if he is not treated like a borrower. That Shmot, Exodus 22, 14. Here you have a disagreement among the Tanaim whether he is regarded as a paid Shomer because the, the, the right to use the item is like payment or an unpaid Shomer. So the Tana in our Mishnah holds that a renter is like a paid Shomer. That's Gemara Bavetzia 93. 
זאת אומרת, דייסא נושא שכר והסוחר נשבעין על השבורה ועל השבויה ועל המתה. The uh, shomer who's paid and the renter, they swear about an animal in their case, care that it was broken, which is killed by a wild animal, captured by, a, let's say, bandits, or that it died a natural death. Uh, there are uh, the examples of the Torah gives of unavoidable uh, losses. And thereby um, free themselves from having to pay umeshalmin et ha'avida ve'tagneva, but must they must pay in cases of loss and death. So uh, these are the examples of losses that can uh, be avoided with uh, extra care. Now, having listed the different shomrim. and their obligations, the Mishnah now goes through a various cases in which a Shomer swears falsely and teaches in each case whether he is obligated to bring um, the Asham and pay the extra fifth. Um, the extra fifth goes together with um, the Asham, where there is no Asham, there is no payment of fifth, that the Ramba Milchod Gzeilava Avida chapter 7. So they said the Mishnah begins with cases in which um, Anpei Shomer swore falsely. So they said, Amar le Shomer Chinam, Heichan Shuri, a person said to an unpaid Shomer, unpaid guardian, Where is my ox that I gave you to watch? Amar lo Met, the Shomer said to him, What do you want from me? He died naturally. והוא שנשבר או נשבר או נגנב או עבד. But really what happened was that the ox was broken, killed by wild animal, or was captured by a bandit stolen or lost. נשבר, or the Shomer said the ox was broken, killed by wild animal, והוא שמת או נשבר או נגנב או עבד, but really he died naturally, or was captured, stolen or lost. Nishba, or the Shomer said, the ox was captured by bandits. Vehu shemet on nishba on ignav avad, but the re uh, really it died naturally, or was broken, killed, stolen, or lost. Nignav, or the Shomer said, the ox was stolen. Vehu shemet on nishba on nishba avad, but really it died naturally, or was broken, captured, or lost. Avad, or the Shomer said the ox was lost, over who shemet on nishbar on nishbar on nignav, but really died naturally, or was broken, captured, or stolen. Mashbi'acha ani. In all of these cases, if the owner of the ox then said to him, I impose an oath on you regarding the claim. Ve'amar amen, and the Shomer said amen, meaning in order for the um, uh, Shomer to be exempt, the Shomer must... swear that um, what he said was, is true. So in our cases, the Shomer imposed this oath on the Shomer. Uh, I, I mean, in our case, the owner imposed uh, this oath on the Shomer. And by the Shomer answering, Kel Melech Neiman, Amen, which like affirmation to it, he is considered to have made an oath himself. So the Amar Amen, and later admitted that he lied. Part two, he is not obligated to bring an Asham or pay the extra fifth, even though he swore falsely. It's because uh, an unpaid Shomer will not have had to pay for the ox, even if he had told the truth. Um, if you remember, we learned it in the previous uh, Mishnah, an unpaid Shomer does not have to pay of, for any kind of loss uh, unless he was negligent. So he certainly does not have to pay for an unavoidable losses such as natural death, being killed by wild animal and captured by bandits. So he does not even have to pay for the animal being stolen or lost even though these losses are considered somewhat unavoidable. So basically, as we see here, so that he lied, not free him from any payment. A false oath does 
not free the oath taking from taker from paying um, uh, does not require an asham and the payment of an extra fifth. Um, the, even the the Mishnah here teaches that uh, that he does not bring an asham for a false oath of deposit. He must nevertheless bring a variable korban olevi yored chatat offering for having made a false oath of declaration, which called shvuat bitui, since he swore falsely about something that happened in the past. That's the Tosfot Yom Tov explained based on the Gemara. We're going to study Mitzvahim. So. Here the Mishnah gives another set of examples for an unpaid Shomer being exempt even though he swore falsely. Hey Khan Shori, a person said to an unpaid Shomer, where is my ox? Amar lo, the Shomer said to him, en I don't know, I don't know what you are talking about. Which is, I never receive any ox from you and I do not owe you anything. But the, 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 really he had uh, been giving an ox uh, to watch and it was later die naturally, it was broken, which is killed, captured, stolen, lost. If the owner of the ox uh, then said to him, I impose an oath on you regarding your claim, and the Shomer said, Amen to it, and he later admitted that he lied. So you see here, the Shomer is not obligated to swear in um, this case. The Tiferet Israel explained that since uh, he claims that he never became a Shomer, so the owner, however, asked him to swear to this, and he accepted an oath. Uh, so the Mishnah said, Patu. So he is not uh, obligated to bring an Asham or pay an extra fifth, even though he swore falsely. This is because um, the unpaid Shomer will not have had to pay in these circumstances, even if he had told the truth. So since um, his false oath did not free him from um, any obligation, it does not bring an offering for it. So even what we see, even when an unpaid um, Shomer does not uh, d does um, unpaid Shomer does swear falsely to free himself uh, from payment, he is not ob always obligated to bring an offering, um, an Asham offering, and pay an extra fifth. The Mishnah teaches that he is obligated and when is not. The Mishnah asks, Hey Khan Shori, Hey Khan Shori, a person said to an unpaid Shomer, where is my ox? Amar lo avat. The Shomer said to him, it was lost. So you see here an unpaid Shomer uh, does not pay for a lost item unless he was negligent. That's what we learned earlier. Mashbiachani. So the owner of the ox then said to him, I'm imposing an oath on you regarding, to, uh, regarding this claim. And the Shomer said to him, yes, amen. Here you have the witnesses that testified against him that it was not lost, rather the Shomer consumed himself. So the law is that the Shomer pays only the principal, which is in a way the value of the ox. But he does not have to bring an asham or pay an extra fee for swearing falsely. It's because the asham and extra payment apply only to a shomer who admits his lie, not a shomer whose lie is established through witnesses. The reason for this is um, that the asham and extra payment are for the purpose of atoning for the sin swearing falsely, and atonement can some come only to someone who re, um, uh, regret his sin and confess it. He also does not pay the uh, double payment of a thief, except in the circumstance that the Mishnah will uh, soon describe. However, if the Shomer admitted on his own that he swore falsely, Meshalem Keren Vechomesh 
ve'asham. He pays the principal, plus, as we explained earlier, the extra fifth, which is the Torah refers to this payment as a fifth. You see in Leviticus chapter 5, verse 24, but in fact, it equates a quarter of the principal. It is called a fifth because once it is added to the payment, it constitutes one fifth of the total. You see it in Boba Metzia 53, 54. For example, if the principal was 20 in those days, zoos, the extra fifth will be five zoos, which um, this is a fifth of the total payment of 25 zoos. And then the third one is the Asham, is bring an Asham offering. Asham offering since he admits that he consumed the animal himself and swore falsely about it, he must pay the extra fifth and bring the Asham offering to atone for his false oath. Now, the same is true um, even if he admits that the, uh, he swore falsely after, after um, the witnesses testified. Since he admits his sin, he atones for it by paying an extra fifth, uh, bringing an Asham offering. You see it in Rabbi Akiva Iger on Bavakama chapter 9. You see it in Tosfot there. Anyway, Heichan Shori. So what we see in the previous case, we see that the unpaid Shomer claimed he swore falsely that the ox was being lost. And the Mishnah now teaches the law in the case where the, he claimed and swore falsely that the ox had been stolen. Heichan Shori, a person said to unpaid Shomer, where is my ox? Amar Nignav, the Shomer said to him, it was stolen. Mashbiachani. The owner of the ox said to him, I impose an oath on you regarding the claim. And Shomer said, Amen. The witness now testified against him that it was not stolen by another person. Rather, he stole it himself. The law is that the Shomer must pay a double payment since he falsely claimed that the ox was stolen. He is considered a thief. And a thief paid double. Normally, if a Shomer keeps a deposit and tries to free himself from paying for it by swearing falsely, his action is not considered an act of theft. And he is not liable for double payment. Since the Shomer is holding it for the owner, he cannot, quote-unquote, steal it uh, from the owner's possession. However, we learn from the, the Pasuk that if he tried to free himself with the claim, and all that the object was stolen, he is considered a thief and he must pay a double payment. So you see in the previous pay case in the Mishnah, however, he swore that the ox was lost, not stolen. So therefore, he does not pay the double payment. So the Mishnah said, however, he does not bring an asham or pay the extra hamishi, the extra thief because he did not admit that he had sworn falsely. If the Shomer admitted on his own that he swore falsely, he pays the principal plus an extra fifth and bring an Asham offering. As uh, we said in this case, he does not pay the double payment even though he's considered a thief because of the general rule that a person who admits to a penalty does not pay it. Since the double payment is considered a penalty, his admission exempts him from paying it. So the idea is what Bekeva Eagle and others, you see, uh, explain that the extra fifth is not considered a penalty in this regard because its purpose is to atone. So therefore, he must pay uh, this even he admits to it. You see that he felt as well on uh, the Mishnayot Bavakama chapter 9, Mishnah 8. Now, Rabbi Kiva Iger add to that, you see it in the Tosfot of Rabbi Akiva Iger, he said that if he admit that he lied after witnesses testified against him, he does um, pay the double payment, admitting to a penalty, Rabbi Kiva Iger uh, brings sources, exempt the person from paying it only if he does, does so before witnesses testify that he owes it discusses a situation, a case in which uh, the thief, the ganav, admitted to uh, stealing an ox, not necessarily ox nowadays, but the concept, but denied slaughtering or selling it. Ra'ah, 
המשנה סל אמר לאחד בשוק, If a person says to someone in the street, היכן שהוא איש שגנבת? Where um, is the, my ox that you stole? והוא אומר לו גנבתי, the person said I never did it, I, I did not sto- uh, uh, steal it. והעדים העדים אותו שגנבו, he have a witness that comes in and against him and says this guy really did steal it, משלם תשלומי כפל. So obviously the law is that he pays the double payment. Uh, the, the Pasuk said in Shemot uh, Kavbet, Exodus 22:3, if the theft is found in his hand, he shall pay כפל, double. טבח ומכר, if the witness said that he also Um, slaughter or sold it after he stole it. Here it's much serious, משלם תשלומי ארבעה וחמישה. He need to pay fourfold or fivefold payment. The Torah states, this is in the book of Exodus chapter 21 verse 37, that if a person steals a sheep and slaughters um, or, or sell it, he pays four times the value of the sheep and if he does uh, um, to an ox, he pay five times the value. That's usually they um, include the usual double payment for stealing it plus another double or triple payment for slaughtering or uh, selling it. So here, since the Mishnah is uh, speaking of an ox, the thief must pay five times the value of what he stole. The Mishnah said fourfold or fivefold only because the Mepharshim said it's, um, yeah, this is just the, the expression that uh, used uh, everywhere for the extra payment for slaughtering and selling. So here, as we said, the Mishnah discussed a case which the thief admitted to stealing an ox um, but denied slaughtering or selling it. If the thief saw witnesses approaching and he was afraid that they were coming to court to testify against the theft, אמר גנבתי אבל לא טבחתי ולא מכרתי. So he's now admitted in a way in part because he's afraid that the court will put on him a huge fine, right? So he said, I stole the ox, but guess what? I did not slaughter or sell it. And the witnesses then came and testified that he had <laughs> slaughtered or sold it. אינו משלם אלא קרן. Here, the law is that this smart thief, right? He pays only the principal. but not the double payment for stealing and not the fivefold payment for slaughtering or selling it. He does not pay the double payment because it is penalty payment and the person who admits, even <laughs> not uh, because he's such a tzaddik, but he admits to a penalty, does not pay it. Um, that's uh, we learn early in the Mishnah. even though he admitted to it because he thought the witnesses were going to testify against him, his admission still <laughs> frees him from paying the penalty. Um, and even though the witnesses later testified that he stole the ox, his early admission will freeze him from paying the penalty. Now, um, here, as you see, the... Um, They, uh, he does not pay the fivefold payment because wherever a person is exempt from um, the double payment, he's also exempt uh, from fivefold payment. Uh, they, uh, you see it in the Mefarshim, based on the Gemara and Bavakama 75b, they said although the thief did not, did not admit to slaughtering or selling it, he is still exempt from paying the fivefold penalty. It's because the Torah decrees only a fivefold payment for an ox, not anything else, so only, not anything less. So since uh, the fivefold payment includes the double payment and the thief is exempt from the payment, we could only um, obligate, him to, obligate him to pay four times the value, not five. So consequently, he does not pay any penalty payment. So here the Mishnah resume its uh, discussion of a Shomer, a guardian, who swears falsely. Having uh, previously taught um, uh, the law of unpaid uh, Shomer, Shomer Chinam, who swears falsely, if you remember, we have it in the previous Mishnayot, this part of the Mishnah uh, focuses on the next of the four Shomrim and Bauer. The Shoel, the borrower, Tosfot Yontov explained to us 
um, was not obligated to swear in these cases since even uh, according to his claim, he has uh, to pay the lender. Nevertheless, the lender wanted him to swear about what actually occurred, and the borrower did so by answering Amen. Amar Lashuel, Heichan Shuri. So here a person said to the, the borrower, Where is my ox that I lent you? Amarlo, so uh, the bower said to him, 9b, met, <laughs> the bower said to him, it died naturally. Now, as we all know, the reality is different. And what happened is, Vehu shenishbar, o nishba, o nignav, or Avad, but really what happened was it was broken, which is killed by a wild animal, captured by bandits, stolen or, or lost. Nishbar, or the bower said, it was broken. Vehu shemet, or nishba, or nignav, or Avad, but really it died naturally, was captured stolen or lost nish ba or the bower said it was captured vehu shemet on ishbar on ignav or avad but really it died naturally or was broken stolen or lost nignav or the bower said it was stolen vehu shemet on ishbar on ishbar or avad but really it died naturally or was broken captured or lost avad or the bower said it was lost the reality is, Vehu Shemet, Onishbar, Onishbar, Onignav. The reality, it died naturally or was broken, captured or stolen. Mashbiachani, in each of these cases, the lender said to him, I impose on you an oath um, regarding your claim. The Amar Amen, and the bower said, Amen to it. So the bower was not obligated to um, swear in these cases, since um, uh, even according to his claim, he has to pay the lender, so that's what we said, that Tosfot Yontav explained that the lender wanted him to swear about what actually occurred, and the bower did so by swearing Amen. So the Mishnah said, Patu. So the law is that the bower is exempt from bringing the Asham, the special offering, and paying the extra fifth. The answer, why is that? It's because a bower is responsible for un avoidable losses such as natural death, attacks by wild animals um, and capture and certainly for the animal being stolen or um, getting lost. So therefore when he swore falsely that these things happened he did not exempt himself from paying and his oath is that not subject to the asham and additional pay payment of the fifth. If you remember, that's what we learned at the beginning of the uh, Perek. A false oath is uh, yeah, subject to these things only if it is exempted the person from paying the claim. Here you have a situation since the bower was not exempt from paying, even according to his oath, he does not bring the offering or pay the extra fifth for swearing falsely. So our Mishnah teaches that uh, the rule applies not only to an oath made to exempt a Shomer who would have been exempt anyway, but uh, even to an oath that has the effect of obligating a Shomer who was obligated anyway. So here the Mishnah continues to discuss the uh, law of a borrower who swore falsely. It uh, now teaches a case where a bower is liable to the asham and additional fifth. Heichan Shuri, a person said to a bower, Where is my ox that I lent to you? The bower said, I have no clue what you're saying, what are you talking about? Which means I never borrowed anything from you and I do not owe you anything. And the reality is, 
והוא שמת או נשבר או נשבע או נגנב או עבד. All of that was happened to him. It either died naturally, was broken or uh, captured or stolen or lost. Mashbiachani, the lender said to him, I impose an oath on you regarding that. Ve'amar amen. And the borrower said, amen. And later admitted that he swore falsely. Chayav, he is obligated to bring a sham offering and pay the extra fifth. <laughs> By saying that he never borrowed the ox, he freed himself from paying for it. So since he swore falsely to this claim, he is obligated to bring an asham and pay the extra fifth. Having concluded its discussion of the uh, Shomer Chinam, an unpaid Shomer, and the borrower, the Mishnah now illustrates these laws for two remaining Shomrim. Nose Sachal, the paid Shomer, Vehasocher and the renter. The Mishnah begins with cases in which these Shomrim are exempt from the Asham and fifth. Amar le Nose Sachar Vehasocher. The person said to a Shomer who is paid or to a renter. So these two are subject to the same, in a way, in some area, the same rules. Uh, they are obligated to pay for the animal being stolen or getting lost, but they are not obligated to pay for unavoidable losses, such as natural death, uh, being killed by a wild animal, or being captured by bandits. Heichan um, Shuri, where is my ox? Amar he said to him, he died naturally. But the reality, as we said, what happened? was that it was broken or captured by bandit, nishbar, or the, the Shomer said it was broken, v'hu shemet o nishbar o nishbar, nishbar, v'hu shemet o nishbar, nigna v'hu shavad, avad v'hu shenigna mashbiachani v'amar amen patus. All of that, he's not obligated to, gain, to bring a sham or pay the fifth. Um, it, in the first three cases which, where the ox die, a natural death or was killed or captured, he is exempt because he will not have had to pay even if it was told the truth. For example, if he swore that the animal died naturally, but uh, in fact it was killed by a wild animal. So he was really exempt from paying anyway since a paid Shomer does not have to pay for an ox killed by a wild animal. So in the last two cases where it was stolen or lost, he is exempt because even according to his oath, he had to pay. His false oath did not free him from anything. For example, if he swore, um, let's say that the animal uh, was stolen, but uh, it really had been lost. So he's obligated to pay anyway since a paid Shomer is responsible for something that was stolen. So here the Mishnah cites um, several more cases in which a paid Shomer and renter are not obligated. Avad or Nignav, if the paid Shomer <coughs> excuse me, or rented said the ox was lost or it was stolen, in the same case, Vehushem met or Nishbar or Nishbar. The reality died naturally or was broken or captured. Mashbiachani, he said, I impose an oath upon you. Amar Amen, he said, yes, Amen. And later he admitted that he lied. But two, the law is that the Shomer is not obligated to bring the Asham or pay an extra fifth because in these cases that the animal died or was broken or captured, he would not have to pay and it was only his false oath that it was lost or stolen, that made him responsible to pay. So here the Mishnah summarizes the law uh, taught in the previous uh, examples with a general rule, Zehaklal, that's the basic principle. And uh, many times the Tana, the Ritva, and others said, said Zehaklal, even it doesn't say it uh, clearly, uh, basically, it's just in order, the Ritva and others said, in order to remember it properly. Whoever changes from one claim of responsibility to another claim of responsibility, which is, uh, he, he, uh, had he told the truth, he would have been required to pay, and what he lied and, and said happened also requires him to pay, 
ומפטור לפטור, או the other way around, from one claim uh, for not being responsible to another claim for not being responsible, which is uh, he had told the truth he will not have been required to pay, and what he lied and said happened also does not require him to pay, umiptur lechova, or from a, a claim for not being responsible to a claim of responsibility, which is had he told the truth, he will not have been required to pay, and what he lied and said happened requires him to pay. So they said patu, he is not obligated to bring an asham or to pay an extra fifth for his false oath. However, the other way around, mechova lifto, any shomer who changes from a claim of responsibility to one for which he is not responsible to pay, chayav, he is obligated to bring an asham and pay the extra fifth um, if he later admits that he lied because his false oath freed him from paying what he was required to pay. So now the Mishnah phrases this rule in kind of different way. Zehaklal, this is the principle. So Lichura, the Torah Chaim, and other Tosfot Yom Tov said that that's basically a repetition of the previous one. <coughs> But the explanation we um, understand based on the Tosvat Yom Tov and the, the Ran hold the only the first Klal um, is a very serious possibility to not have the gears of the second. But the idea is if the oath taker makes it neither easier for himself nor harder, he too is treated like someone who made it harder for himself and is not obligated to bring in a sham or pay the extra fifth. That's the view of Tosvat Yom Tov here. The, the, the Tiferet Israel Nado said that that's the way sometimes it's in the Shas. But anyway, whoever swears falsely to make it easier for himself is obligated to bring Lasham and to pay the fifth. But whoever swears falsely to make it harder for himself is not obligated to bring the Asham offering and pay the fifth. So here we go to the Gemara, and the Gemara dealing with the Reisha of the Mishnah, the subject of Arba'a Shomrim. Man Tana Arba'a Shomrim. So Rashi tells us that very soon we're going to have the answer. Amar Rav Nachman, Amar Rabba Baravua, Rabbi Meirhi. So it means that basically that's the view of Rabbi Meir, usually as we know many times, he's the first one we don't have mentioned in the Mishnah, it's usually a um, general rule is Rabbi Meir, but anyway, Amar le Rava le Rav Nachman, Mi'ika Tanad delit le Arba'a Shomrin, there is a Tanad that does not hold that there are four type of Shomrim, of custodians, um, why you say that it's only Rabbi Meir? Um, so he said, Amar Lei, and those who study with us, Bav Metziah, Socher Apolim, you see the expansion of that. So Rav Nachman responded to Rav and he said, Amar Lei, Hachei Ka'amin Alach, that's exactly what I said to you. Man Tana De Amar, Socher Kenose Sachar Dami. Who, uh, because we said later on in the Mishnah that the Nose Sachar and Socher, they are exempt from Onasim, something about their capability, but they are Chayavim, they are liable in Gneva Vavida. So it means, that we have to say that this Tana speaks about Shomer Sachar and not unpaid custodian Shomer Chinam. Some say Amar Rav Nachman, some omit it. Amar Rabba Baravu Rabbi Meir he. So that's basically in Sachiru Bab Ischaro, the Rabbi Meir is Rashi in Bav Metziah, page 80b, that uh, expanded on that. But anyway, the idea is the Sochel is the same as Nuchse Sachar. So the more challenge, the Ha. Rabbi Meir Ibcha Shmainali, you see the Rabbi Meir hold just the, up, the other way around, that is the same as unpaid guardian, Ditnan, and this is the Braita, or the Tanya, the Masorot Hashat said, anyway, so the, 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 uh, the Tanya or the Tnan, Socher Keitzad Mishalem, what is the responsibility of him from the Din of Shomer, from the um, obligation of a guardian, Rabbi Meir Omer Keshomer Chinam, 
Abimeir said you treated us unpaid paid the guardian that he is patu mignevav avda that he is exempt from stolen or lost an item. Rabbi Yudomer can no se sachar no se sachar meaning that he is the same way as someone who is a pay custodian. Pay custodian meaning is a chayav mignevav avda that is liable when it's lost or stolen. So here Rabbi Bar Avua he should say that the Mishnah hold that socher renter the same as shomer sachar that's a pay guardian and that's the view of Rabbi Yudah not Rabbi Meir. So the Gemara said Rabbi Bar Avua ipratan Rabbi Bar Avua taught the opposite version of the Brayta which means according to Rabbi Meir his din is the same as paid guardian Rabbi Yudah is like unpaid guardian so therefore he put the Mishnah follow the view of Rabbi Meir. So the Gemara asked Tane Arbaa. You mean to say that these four types of guardian are differences for custodians? Shlosha havu. They are uh, essence only three. Why? Because the renter is treated either like a paid custodian or like unpaid custodian. So why you call it four? So now the Shvuat Shomrim. Now the Gemara brings several circumstances that the Mishnah referred to. Amar leShomer chinam vechule chan shuri vechule amar lechad barshuk vechule amar leShomer. All of them are basically exempt from the, 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 the not liable for falsely swear, swearing a custodian oath, which is Chomesh Ve'asham of the uh, oath of deposit. Ve'chayavim, but they have the obligation to pay like Korban Levi Ored, which is the Chatat, uh, according to the economic situation, if they have money, it's expensive, it's an expensive animal, otherwise it's menachot, mishum shvu'ait bitui, because of the false oath of utterance. Ushmuel amar afturim mishvu'ait bitui. Shmuel said that they even exempt, they are not liable for swearing the, for the false oath of utterance. Bemai kamifligir, what's the foundation of their disputation? Shmuel savar that is exempt leita bilhaba. Rav Nachman Savar, the Rav Savar, Eite Bela Vehen. Shmuel hold that um, since this oath cannot be taken in a future tense, so a false oath about a past even does not participate any liability. Rav hold that since the oath can nonetheless be taken both negative and uh, affirmative, when swore falsely, they indeed participate liability for chatat olevi yored, for verbal chatat offering. Veha iflegu bachad zimna. It's already disputed once. Deit mar shvuash zarak plon itzrol ayam. Shvuash lo zarak rav amar chayav ushmul amar patur. That's what we study if you remember on page 25. Rav amar chayav deit abelav hen ushmul amar patur deleit abayaba. So why we need both places? Tzricha, you need both. Diash minan beha. If we talk about Shavua Shazrak Pony Layam, Beha Kamarav Mishum de Minafshika Mishtaba, Val Beach Deve Dina Mishabele, the Bedin cause him to, to take note. Aval Beach Bedina Mishabele, Ema model Shmuel. So you may say that he gives Shmuel, Kedirabi Yami, the Marabi Yami Kol Shavua Shadi Animash Binota, and Chayavim and Mishum Shavuat Bitui Sorashi here tells us, Kedirabi Yami Tamad Rabam and Foresh Lakaman. So just be patient, we're going to um, discuss it soon. Vit Marbea, if it was the disputation between Rabbi Shmuel only the Mishnah, so we hold what? Beha Kamar Shmuel. So it, the, 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 only in this case did Shmuel state that there is no liability because here the Rabbinic court forced the custodian to swear. Aval behach, when is someone taken all oh, that Ploni Zarak Layam, the case of Pavel, Ema Modele Le Rav. You may say that he agree with the Rav, that Shmuel uh, considered with the Rav that the oath taker is liable for making a false oath of utterance, since the oath was voluntarily. Yechayev, Nishba Le'atzmo. So, so therefore we need to know that Rav Shmuel disputed in both two in Yanim, Tzricha, both is necessary regardless. Ben ishba me'atzmo, ben bebedin tzricha. Now I just want to give a short a vignette talk before we do the seal in Mitzvah Shem. Um, just a short uh, 
דבר תורה. We talk in this מסכת, מסכת שבועות, and um, it's a, as we said, that it's a famous חתם uh, סופר, that he uh, uh, studied with his student uh, Daf every day for the entire sphere at Aomer between Pesach to Shavuot. Each day is a Daf, so they completed 49 on Shavuot, even if you go by the Otiot, Lag Baomer, 33rd of the Omer, which is Daf Lamed Dalet, because it's a 34, we start the Masechet at page 2. And if you look, zoom in on Daf Lamed Dalet, page 34, you see that that um, that actually is like Baomer in a sense, is the Lula de Rajbi, and Rabbi Shibon Omer, Machach Uole B'Marava, we learn that they laugh in the Marava in Eretz Yisrael, and there's a big discussion in the Gemara what exactly they laugh about, what is it, and the Gemara did not left, give us a very clear understanding why Machach Uole B'Marava. So there's only when Nishar Yedi Asher Tzachku, we know that they laugh, Rajbi in Eretz Yisrael, we don't know why. So the Chassam Sofer explained to his students while they study every day a daf that that's all applied at Yom Adilula. That was a great simcha in Eretz Yisrael and the other world because it's matched the daf, which is the daf la medalet, which is the 33rd day of the Omer because we don't have daf bet and we start right after Pesach for 49 dapim until Shavuot. So that's match of Lag Baomer, which is Machachu Alei Marava, that Eretz Yisrael is bring a great light and joy to have the merit, the privilege of uh, Rabbi Shimon ben Yochai uh, bring so much uh, spirituality and goodness to the world. The Briske Rav said that Siyum Masechet is Et Ratzon, and we mentioned earlier that Rabbi Chaim Falaji said that Masechet Shavuot especially is a, is a sgula le'atzirat gshamim, that if Chaz Shalom, especially in Eretz Yisrael, they, they have a lack of rain, this is a good um, to study and it helps. But um, the concept of Shavuah, it is written that Abraham Avinu, we heard it several weeks ago, Karat Briti Mavimelech have a covenant with Avimelech. And in Parashat Vayera, the Torah said that Shevach Vasot Levadana. And then they said, Nishbeu Shnehem. Vayikra Shem HaMakom Ahu Be'er Shava, they call that place Be'er Shava, Ki Sham Nishbeu Shnehem, because that place, both of them, took an oath. The question is what is connected. So seven and Shvu'ah, number seven in Shvu'ah, that's Sheva, that's Shvu'ah, the Shin Bet Vav Ein Hei, they have the same Shoresh, the same root in Hebrew, which is Shin um, uh, Bet and Ein. That's Mispar Sheva, the number seven, More Al Ruchaniyut. It's a, if the entire court of Judaism, this entire core of the, the credence, uh, the, 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 the faith of Judaism, especially from the whole different uh, biblical sources, it's all applied to spirituality. The Maharal, the great rabbi of Prague, Ma'arich uh, Rabot, he expanded a lot over this concept of seven relate to Ruchan Yud. So the Shoresh of Kol Olam, the root of the whole world, is Otiot Aleph and Bet. Sheva Gorem Lateva, number seven, is the cause of the existence of nature, of the world. So there is a yesh dimayon, there is a very big mechanism because ruchaniyut, that's the, the, the essence of the world, the spirituality. So here you have Avimelech and Abraham, that the oath is sheva kivsot, that's the esoda olam, the essence of the world, that hit kashrut ruchanit, that is the essence of spirituality, that um, you cannot do it um, without it. But just just a little vignette of the idea of what is this Masechet. Um, Mitzvah Shem Adesiyum, we're going to point it out um, a book that we usually use by the end of the Masechet, which is a little bit Kabbalah, the Maaseh Rokeach, and the whole idea of the numbers here and how it's connected together. The, the number is 1531, which is the number of all the eight Prakim. And more, in Mitzvah Shem, when we get to the Siyum, we're going to um, expand on that.